Professor Sue yeah, yeah. has a question. Well, uh, I want to comment uh, on a, a great congeniality between Rothbard and me on, on these topics. And uh, in particular, we very much uh, agree about the importance of Book Two of Hume's treatise and uh, the passions. And in fact, uh, many philosophers stop reading Hume with Book One. Uh, particularly undergraduates, that's what they usually get. Uh, Hume himself thought, and Russell and I have discussed this, that the work on the passions was what was really original in the treatise. And uh, I, I think that's very much true. Uh, he uh, left it out of the inquiry, which is a modification, as Russell uh, stated, and kept in an appendix, because he was criticized for this work on the past. It was, it was so original and new, uh, it wasn't properly appreciated. And uh, the resolution of those comments, Russell and I, I read his paper, we've already discussed it a bit, and uh, fortunately, in those days, we had a seminar uh, here at Stanford because he was here half time, half time at NYU. And I, I think- uh, Got a perfect arrangement. Perfect arrangement. So we're going to see if we can't run some kind of joint seminar next winter session between Stanford and NYU to continue this dialogue about human sympathy. I, I loved his paper and uh, found many clarifying things about it. Thanks. Okay. Uh, asked uh, two questions. Uh -huh. First one, you stressed the idea that the communication is nonverbal. What's the Why is verbal in a, in a why is that relevant? I mean, why, why can't I communicate my pain to you? Oh, you can. Verbally, and you, yeah. uh, you know, you, you don't necessarily. So, uh, but the, you put a big, you seem to put a lot of emphasis on the nonverbal character. I didn't see why verbal communication isn't. There is obviously other communication. There's facial yeah. and all that, but why shouldn't verbal be included? It is included in our explanation of what's going on. But mirroring per se does not, in fact, require that. So mirroring. Well, it doesn't necessarily. Isn't, it, isn't one way of projecting the image which is mirrored what I'm saying to you? Uh, well, I want to comment on that. Yeah. yeah. No, I want to comment <laughs> <Thank> on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think what, what I've come to recognize is very important that in the study of speech, it, too much emphasis is put on its cognitive aspects. Uh, the, the young child says, Mommy, why aren't you talking to me like this? I haven't done anything wrong. And the child has perceived that the mother's uh, emotional quality of the language is expressing impatience, etc. Characteristically of, the, of our perception of emotion, the receiver is better at perceiving it than the one who delivers the emotion. And, and this perception that speech has emotional qualities that we are extraordinarily sensitive at perceiving. And in fact, uh, a, a typical thing uh, in, in, in people who are very close, the perception of emotion is almost more acute. Uh, I mean, often what's said is so repetitious it doesn't matter too much about the cognitive content, but you can know how things have gone over through the day when you see that person uh, by the quality of the of the speech you receive. And I, I think what's very important, nonverbal here means without the expression of the words, but the emotion is actually carried in the speech. I don't say I'm mad. You pick that up immediately from indirectly in this way. And I think that's extraordinarily important, much too ignored and typically in the philosophical tradition of discussing uh, the cognitive character of language. I couldn't resist the... <laughs> Ken, Ken and I continually talk about the yeah, so. <laughs> Let me ask you a second question. You had a second question. Uh, <laughs> you don't have to sit down, Pat. You can be ready on this one also. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, but you were very right mirror, and I thought you were going to lead up to something, which there's a lot of... I seem to read, I don't, I'm no, no way an expert in this, but something called mirror neurons. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Go, the, the, the question is that you know, this... Sympathy has got a, a basis yep. for, uh, which I believe is true of a number of animals. I mean, it's not true, not only human, but I understand it. Yeah, I've been, I mean, yeah, in fact, you can respond to uh, an ape or any number of other things, and they probably be your pet cat or a dog, and they respond in the same sorts of ways. Well, this gives a physiological uh, 
basis uh, for these and neurological judgments. Right? Yeah. A right. neurological basis. You mean? A neurological basis. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. In is fact, that, is there anything interesting from a point of view of studying morals occurring again from these from these physiological studies? Uh, probably. It certainly goes to the kind of program that Hume had, which is to explain your scientifically explain your attachment to a particular moral value and my attachment perhaps to a different one. And so it, it has a lot to do with the explanation in the scientific sense of your and my beliefs about morals, as opposed to somehow working through a theory that's going to show us what is the truth. Uh, for human, there is no truth in morals. Well, all of is human. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Uh, yeah, this question is, as I understand Hume, if, like if I have a pain, that's a sensation, then I form an idea of it that in some strange way resembles it. And when I anticipate having a pain, or remember having a pain, it's that idea that's involved. So my question is, and forgive me if you made this clear in my mind, uh, is the mechanism involved in sympathy and the mechanism involved in anticipating or remembering one's own pain? essentially the same, uh, I mean, is, is the idea that's involved when I'm sympathetic to your pain the same one I would employ when I'm remembering or anticipating? This gets back again to Ken's uh, point. I think there's something fundamentally important about the way in which this communication takes place that we should perhaps see more uh, and develop more and uh, see how it actually works in various contexts. I think it's significant and different from just ordinary reasoning about these things. When you're talking about the reasoning that I go through from a past experience that might be related to the current experience, that's a little bit like the claim on the part, I mean, that's contrary to the claim on the part of Hume that somehow these things might be completely simultaneously. It's not that I see or feel or whatever and then interpret it's that I instantly do the whole schmear so that I see whatever is going on in your mind. Uh, I capture that in my mind, and I don't have to reason about it at all. In fact, that's a very important part of it for Hume, is that it does not require reason. That may not be satisfactory. We have a lot of questions here, Rosie. Absolutely. We're going to be kept at work for a while. Um, is there a connection to some of the more recent work in the psychoanalytic tradition of people like uh, Carl Jaspers or Rolla May, uh, for example, to you know, trace that at all? I suspect, although I'm not sufficiently uh, articulate in their writings to in fact say that, although that raises the question just a moment ago about whether the mirror neurons and so forth are going to be a helpful thing in our trying to understand what's going on in these contexts, and I think probably yes, so far the work is at a, a somewhat early stage, and I would guess that it would get much richer as time passes, and then we would answer those kinds of questions better. So I'm just wondering about if we turn the mirror slightly around, so taking an idea like in sociology of the looking glass self, that we use the other as a form of self-reflection. So for example, does Hume have any account for how we might uh, if I do a behavior that is morally disgusting to others, could I learn that and have some kind of gain in self-knowledge by seeing a disgust response in others? I don't think so. I may be wrong. There might be a note here or there about such things, but that's a nice point. So, maybe I misunderstood you, but it seems you're talking about a kind of universality of the mirroring experience. Uh, but where in that picture uh, is the very common situation where one person is inflicting pain on another uh, without any empathy, without any concern? Uh, no, I don't actually think there's much of anything universal. So uh, it's not a universality condition that's at uh, stake here. It's in fact that that's one of the modes in which we operate, or many of us do operate. And that's about as far as I think we can probably go. So there could be, in the midst of all of this, people for whom, in fact, inflicting pain gives more pleasure uh, than the pain itself gives pain. 
we'll have time for one more. Uh, a small point about the Hugh, uh, the, uh, namely this, that his notion of sympathy is a completely naturalistic notion. It, it, it simply means that uh, emotions are transferred <coughs> from person to person. It's not a pro sentiment in you sense. He discusses the question whether there's a, what he calls the universal uh, uh, feeling of benevolence. And he says, oh yes, it's true that uh, my neighbor's uh, joy makes me joyous and his misery makes me miserable. But that has nothing to do with benevolence. It's mere sympathy. Yeah, I think that's part of the scientific stance that he's taking toward yeah. all of this stuff. And that, uh, that's, for whatever reason, lost in a long period of time brought back by Kemp Smith and uh, more, more recent writers. But there was a period in which the most original parts of Hume were essentially lost to the contemporary reading, and it's good to see some of that coming back. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you.